Cincinnati, Ohio, Redland Field. It's October 1st, the opening game of the 1919 World Series. The Reds take on the Chicago White Sox in the first ever best of nine series. Sox manager Kid Gleason is confident. He calls on knuckleballer Eddie Seacott, who led the league in wins, to start game one. Seacott and other stars like left fielder Shoeless Joe Jackson are expected to power the Sox to the title. and I'm a sports historian. I've dedicated the last 15 hours of my life to the history of the 1919 White Sox scandal. My name is Thomas Joseph and I am a homeschooled historian. I believe that history is best told when you go beyond the history books and into a few nefarious blogs. It was a dark day in history, I do remember that. Uh, eight members of the, of the White Sox were accused of throwing away the 1919 World Series against the Cincinnati Reds. Um, this was masterminded by Arnold Rothstein, who was the kingpin of the Jewish Mafia in New York City. Yeah, so the Chicago White Sox was owned by Charles Comiskey, who was uh, severely despised by his players. Well, in my country, what he would be known as is someone who is chindi. Chindi meaning he was a very stingy fellow, didn't particularly pay his players really well. Uh, what's the scoop, Harry? Mr. Comiskey sent these down for you. Congratulations for a successful pennant race. Well, that's wide of him. Uh, <laughs> he didn't have dementia when we could expect that bonus he promised us if we took the flag, did he? This is your bonus. Cheap bastard. And the fact that his players were so underpaid was probably one of the reasons why they went in to seek this money from the gamblers anyway. Being the 1917 World Series winners, um, they still did have uh, some of the highest paid players in the league, but overall the players were paid pretty poor. And due to baseball's reserve clause, uh, players were denied contracts. Players who were who denied contracts could be banned from the MLB. Uh, players couldn't seek out trades or talk to other teams about joining them. Uh, the working theory is that players were being underpaid, which led them to being approached by gamblers. But the other theory um, is uh, the one that I believe in, is the fact that the players approach the gamblers themselves as a way to spite Comiskey himself. Now, I'm a gambling man, so I like to believe that the gamblers were approached because they too can be honorable people. Story has it that um, the players met up in Chick Yandel's room at the Ansonia Hotel in uh, New York City on uh, September 21st. And uh, Fred McMullen, he actually blackmailed his way into this fix by uh, threatening to expose the ring. So he knew that some players were involved and he decided that, hey man, if they're gonna get a payday, why can't I get a payday? And I respect that, Fred. Um, but the pitchers, Sicote and Williams, they received a boost when the, the starting pitcher, Faber, got the flu and he couldn't even pitch. So he was not a part of the ring. Yeah, honestly, I can see where the players are coming from because um, Arnold Rothstein gambled $100,000 on the series by most accounts. So for that kind of a payday, man, you'd be a fool to say no to something like that. Mr. Rothstein says he's in. 40 grand to the players up front. You hold the other 40 till they blow the series. Tell Seacott to hit the first batter if the fix is on. So during the game itself, when the series started, uh, actually Sikote's second pitch of the series hits uh, Cincinnati hitter Mori Rath in the back. And that was the indication to all eight players and the gamblers involved that they were willing to go through with the fix. Um, sports writers and sports casters actually started getting suspicious of certain plays made in the game, um, specifically in the fourth inning when a bad throw led to a double, uh, took away a double play. 
and uh, seasoned pitcher Williams lost all of his three games while rookie Dickie Kerr won both of his starts. So those things were giving uh, were indications of some sort of fix happening in the game itself. Um, but what actually happened was the gamblers were then uh, reneging on payments um, and angry for not being paid. All eight players double crossed the gamblers and won games six and seven. So at this point, the gamblers are pissed because they're looking at a hundred thousand dollars that they've gambled on these players, and now suddenly they've gone and won two games, and it's come down to the final game. So actually, before game eight, there were threats that were made to the players and their family members. Who sent you? You made a promise to certain people. You son of a bitch! You can't protect her. If I don't do it, somebody else will. First inning, Mr. Williams. Um, that's when you have lefty Williams who pitches and gives up three runs. The Sox lose the game and the series. So players involved received $5,000 each or more. And I think Chick Gandal was the one who received the most because he took home like around $35,000. Well, so the aftermath of this is that people obviously start to find this a little fishy. You have one of the most successful teams in the Chicago White Sox who had just won a World Series very recently. And they've gone down without any fight to the Cincinnati Reds who weren't really even... Um, in the in, in the running for this, um, so rumors started to circulate around 1920, and in the final series of the season, Comiskey decided to suspend the seven players who were involved in this. Um, uh, and in the series in 1920, uh, the White Sox they lost the series and the National League pennant as well. Uh, a grand jury was set up actually by the end of 1920 because rumors had really picked up that they threw the series away. And the grand jury ended up implicating eight players and five gamblers on the 22nd of October, 1920. There were 10 players and the manager, Kid Gleason, who weren't implicated. And they were given $1,500 each by Comiskey, which was the amount that equaled the difference between the winner and the loser who shared in the World Series in 1919. Now, $1,500 each. That's a little chindi to me. So now, obviously, the grand jury is going to be followed by the trial because the grand jury is just where the prosecutors decide whether they should indict the players or no. So obviously, they felt like they had all the evidence they needed and the case goes to trial on June 27th, 1921. But it was delayed because two defendants uh, fell ill. Mm, A bit uh, fishy, if you ask me. The testimony began on July 18th, 1921. And on July 19th, Burns took the stand and admitted to the scandal, mentioning Rothstein by name. Additional testimony and evidence was presented in the trial. Um, And on July 28th, the defense rested their case. Um, Jury went in for deliberation and in less than three hours, if I'm not wrong, in two hours and 40 minutes, they came out with a single ballot being held and they decided a verdict of not guilty for all accused players. This, of course, did uh, fuel rumors of the jury being paid off by the mob and the mafia. Yeah, so in my opinion, I don't think it was a fair trial. When a player stands up and admits to being guilty and part of the scandal, I think that there in itself should be an admission of guilt. And apparently, uh, signed testimonials and confessions by players uh, to admission of guilt went missing and never reached the jury. Can I ask that the prosecution produce these alleged confessions? Please bring them forward. We don't have them, Your Honor. They've been stolen. I think that just just tells the whole story of how corrupt uh, sports and baseball was back in the day. I mean, this is one of those things where I feel like I would have to agree with Yash um, as much as it pains me. Um, He comes from the world of books and science, but I've grown up with blogs and hearsay. And despite that, I think we can put our differences aside to say that, yeah, we're talking about the mob here. We're talking about gangsters. We're talking about gamblers. And I think there was enough pressure on the jury back then that uh, this couldn't stand a fair trial. So, yeah, no, I don't think it was a fair trial. So Judge Kerry Saul Landis was appointed the commissioner of baseball. And immediately, with all effect, he banned eight players from ever playing baseball. Um, He only took the job after assurances of plenary power. He had absolute unchecked power to restore the integrity uh, of baseball that was lost with this scandal. Um, Despite reinstatement requests, all bans have remained 
and stood the test of time, including Sholess Joe Jackson's consideration into the Hall of Fame. Now, this guy is famous for being a hard ass on all of his cases. There's been cases where he would uh, deliberate even against the big players in America at that point, like Standard Oil, and he was given the maximum fines possible. So, this guy is a guy who has a reputation for not bowing down even when the pressure is high. So what they do is they bring someone like that because what they want to know is whether the MLB is now going to be uh, is going to be an, an institution that's free from disrepute. And who better to bring in for something like that than Mountain Landers himself? The mountain he cannot be moved. The first thing that he does is banning all those eight players from professional baseball and from ever being inducted into the Hall of Fame. Actually, all eight players tried to organize a three-state tour. Um, but Landis warned his players to uh, against playing with these guys uh, for fear of being banned. Um, they then actually tried to host an exhi- exhibition game in Chicago, and the city of Chicago threatened all venues hosting that their license would be taken away if they hosted these eight guys. Um, so in the end, shoeless Joe Jackson uh, is still not in the Hall of Fame. The White Sox would not win another ALCS until 1959. And their latest World Series since 1917 would be 2005. Uh, And this prompted the name, the curse of the Black Sox. One theory about why they're called the Black Sox is because of the chindiness or the stinginess of Comiskey. Apparently, he was so cheap that he charged his own players to launder their team gear at the end of every game. And this led to the plur, to the gears eventually becoming so dirty that they would turn from white to black and that's why they were called the Black Sox. So according to you, should Joe Jackson be inducted into the Hall of Fame? Listen, man. Joe Jackson was a good player and all, like he's obviously well decorated, but the fact is if you've participated in something like this, if you've knowingly collaborated with the mob and with gangsters just to make sure that you, and you don't even have the integrity to kind of go through with a world series and you throw a game, I think that brings so much disrepute to the game that you shouldn't be a part of it. The Hall of Fame is there for a reason. This is it's not the Hall of Infamy. So this is what Yashraj had to say when we asked him the same question. Um, for a trial that was botched, for rumors that were fueled that Joe Jackson was not even in the room when all these meetings and fixes happened, um, it seems like there was a lot of uncertainty and I think he deserves to be in that Hall of Fame. Um, I think he does. Of course, Yash would say something like this, bitch ass. (laughs) But keep it (laughs) though. I'll be drunk by the end of it. (laughs) But stop drinking. Um, uh, By the way, when is this going to air? Uh, Soon, sir, soon. Thank you. Oh, okay. You got it, no? Yeah. Got it? Got it. Okay. Thank you. Me, I have a business card also, by the way. Thank you. Thank you very <laughs> much. <laughs> that was good, that business card. <laughs> it was good. Shoot, sir. Well done. Well done, sir. Yes. Even though we come from different walks of life, I believe that you are the Jack Daniels to my Coca-Cola. Cheers to that. Cheers to that, my friend. On that note, like, share, and subscribe. And do check us out on the Half Revenues Podcast, available on Spotify, Google, and Apple. Cheerio, my friend. Cheerio.